Is it possible that some of the galaxies out there are made of antimatter? How transparent is science research across the world? Which of the Lagrange points is my favorite? And our free bonus question on Patreon, how big of a moon can the Earth sustain? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Mark McGinnis, is it possible that some of the galaxies that we see are composed of antimatter? Wouldn't they look the same? Yeah, in theory, if we could see a galaxy and it was made of antimatter and all of the stars were made of antimatter and all of the planets were made of antimatter and everything was antimatter and there was no matter in that galaxy, it would look the same. But the problem is that, you know, we know that our galaxy is made of regular matter. And that if a galaxy made of matter collided with a galaxy made of antimatter, then you would get annihilation, you get a release of gamma radiation, it would be very obvious. In fact, we can detect the gamma radiation coming from the annihilation of antimatter in various places around the universe. And so if there was entire galaxies made of antimatter, there would be this border between the ones that were made of antimatter and the places in the universe that were made of matter. And there is the intergalactic medium where you've got particles of hydrogen that are moving through space, there's rocks and dust, there's hypervelocity stars that are moving from galaxy to galaxy. And there would be these places where the two parts are mixing and exploding. And it would be the most obvious thing in the universe, there'd be parts of the sky where antimatter and matter annihilation was going on at a scale we can scarcely comprehend. And it would just be super obvious. And we don't see that what we see as far as we can look in all directions is regular matter hanging out without interacting with antimatter. Known unknown, can we double gravitational lens? Theoretically, yes. So with a gravitational lens, you've got some background object like a galaxy, it's emitted light, and then that light passes by a galaxy cluster or something that is in the way. And the light from that distant object follows sort of curved path around the galaxy cluster, and then converges on you as the viewer. And so the light rays that would have gone off and away, they get focused like a telescope, and you get to see this magnificent version, it's allowed the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb to be able to see things that it just wouldn't be able to see with its raw capability. Um, and so the question is, then if you had another galaxy cluster that was even closer, and so then the second galaxy cluster was fine tuning the light rays that were that had been already lensed from the first one, uh, would that work? And, and absolutely, uh, you know, we see multiple lensed telescopes work just great here on Earth that you know, sometimes it takes you a couple of lenses to get the light rays going beautifully parallel and into your eye hole, but people have never seen one. And so there was actually there was a couple of papers we reported on, on Universe Today about searching for a double gravitational lens. So the non coplanar gravitational lens and the communication bridge. So that's the paper. And Here's our story on Universe Today. Domingo Flave, what is your favorite Earth Lagrange point? I, I, I never get that question. What is my favorite Earth Lagrange? So let's think about the options. So we've got the Earth Sun Lagrange points, and we've got the Earth Moon Lagrange points. So Earth Sun L1 in between us and the Sun that allows you to observe the sun, it also allows you to just observe the Earth. That's where the NASA's Discover satellite is, it gives us these really cool images of the Earth. So L1 is pretty cool. L2, that's the place where you've got James Webb and Euclid and Gaia, and it's this place where you can go and hide the sun, the Earth and the moon from your observations and from their, you know, their heat getting in the way of your telescopes. So that's also a very cool place. L3 on the far side of the sun, eh, kind of boring, no good use for that. So we can cross that one off. L4, L5, those are the ones that are ahead and behind the Earth in orbit. Uh, they're cool because they're gravitationally stable. And so you could put things into those locations and they would just hang out there like a telescope. So that's pretty cool. But I think of, of, of those, I would say Earth Sun L2 is my favorite. 
Earth, Moon, same thing. You've got three, right? One on the far side of the Earth, L3, boring. Don't have to worry about that. One in between the Earth and the Moon, L1. That's kind of cool because you could have a space elevator that is uh, going from the Moon up into space, and you could use that. That's pretty cool. Uh, the Earth moon L2 point that would be on the far side of the moon. Uh, you could put communication satellites back there to relay information about what's happening on the far side of the moon. But that's kind of boring. Um, L4, L5, again, ahead and behind the moon in orbit around the Earth. That's where you could put your giant rotating space stations, the L4 colony, the L5 colony. So really, it's between Earth moon L4 and Earth Sun L2. And if I had to pick, I would probably choose Earth Sun L2. That's my favorite Earth Lagrange point. Jedward, how available is space research done by various countries? Do any of them keep secrets? Like it depends on the kind of research and the kinds of secrets that they need to keep. So I'll give you an example of a country that is that is largely transparent, and that's the US. Like most of the space research is done under the auspices of NASA. And so you've got all of the different uh, rovers missions. And in general, NASA makes all of the stuff that's being gathered by those spacecraft transparent, like available immediately, you can go to the website, and you can download every single image taken by the Perseverance rover since the beginning of its operations 100 and whatever 50,000 images from every single camera every time the pictures are taken, you can just go and you can download them if you want and you can do all kinds of analysis on them and discover whatever you want in that data. And so mostly NASA stuff is done in in public. Now there are various collaborations that NASA does with other countries, things like say the Hubble Space Telescope or James Webb, where things are held under an embargo. So whatever astronomers have requested time on James Webb, they get a year of proprietary use of the data, and then the material is released widely to the rest of the world. But there is also uh, space research that is done under the auspices of the military. And so you've got things like say the X 37 B, which is the Space Force reusable rocket plane, where they launch it on top of some rocket, it orbits the Earth for a couple of years, and then comes back to Earth. And it has a collaboration of public and private experiments on board. So there was, you know, with with a recent X 37, there was uh, NASA experiments on board the X 37. And we learned quite a bit about about those experiments, but there were also secret Space Force payloads. Um, you know, and people wonder what that is, and we don't know what it was. But you know, we can assume that it was some kind of, you know, testing materials, testing electronics, trying to see how things operate in space for long periods of time. But the results of that are kept as a military secret, and they will then use that to build their spy satellites and things like that. What is the number of US spy satellites? We don't know. What is the nature of them? What are their capabilities? We don't know. So there's a whole space related military aspect where secrets are being kept. And then you've got versions and flavors of that among all the different nations. So the European Space Agency is a lot more into the let's give an embargo, let's give the the people who propose the science an embargo to be able to get their work together. So in generally, missions like the Rosetta mission, we saw there was a, a multiple year embargo, you know, we can ex assume that's going to happen with other stuff like Ariel and the various upcoming Plato things like that. Um, and then of course, they have military concerns as well. And so there's some of that is going to be classified. And now I would say the worst is China. Um, on some hands. Uh, they're very open and transparent with what they're doing. Uh, they publish a lot of research papers on the same kinds of journals, archive things that people are doing, you know, astronomers get time on the fast telescope, they do a bunch of research, they publish the results, the sensors in China have a very light touch on, on what they do. Uh, in other situations, collaboration, so people from Europe or the US or whatever can go and work on the fast telescope and be able to do their results and, and that's not necessarily censored. But then they've got their missions, you've got things like the Chang'e missions, the Tianwen missions, what's happening on the Chinese space station. And you're seeing a filtered version of that that is 
passing through the sensors, deciding which of the things they want to make publicly available and which things they want to keep closer to their chest. And as a journalist, that's incredibly frustrating because I want to know everything, right? I want to be able to just find out about this kind of stuff. And then you've got to assume that there is a military layer on top of that where they are hiding their capability um, with you know, military technology with uh, their ability to do Earth observation, spy satellites, and things like that. So, so, you know, there's always this blend, but generally scientific information that's done to understand the mechanisms on the moon or Mars reaches the public fairly quickly up from any nation within a couple of years from when it's taken or immediately if it's NASA. Do you want even more questions and answers? Well, it's almost time for the monthly patron only question show. I send this out on the 15th of every month. And then me and my producer Anton go through and answer the questions over what is becoming a longer and longer show sometimes more than three hours. Uh, but it's great, I get a chance to do a little bit more research ahead of time. Anton has a physics degree. And so we chat about the answers to those questions. And you're guaranteed right now, if you ask a question there, you will get an answer. Now, Go to patreon.com slash universe today and I will put out the call on the 15th of March. So it's right around the corner. Now I want to thank our new patrons. Thanks to Craig Fisher, Dwali, Mark Lindavell, James Hill, Millie Madison, Fiona and Donnie Firefly Farm. Mouse destruction. What happens if we find out where life started? Do we put a museum there? I love this question. Um, so I mean, obviously, it's kind of astonishing to think about the fact that we don't know where life started that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor that you know, we are we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees and, and we chimpanzees share a common ancestor with dolphins and we dolphins and ch chimpanzees share a common ancestor with rats and so on and you go all the way back down the tree of life and eventually you end up with whatever was the first organism. And we don't know where it started. Uh, and we don't know how it started. So maybe it started in some random puddle on the surface of planet Earth that was struck by lightning and just had the right chemicals and, and it created a complex enough molecule that then was able to continue evolving and then fall under Darwinian evolution to continue on from their natural selection. Or maybe it life started at the bottom of the ocean with these hydrothermal vents. Uh, we just don't know. Um, and it could be that it that it started multiple times and but only the the family that we are part of was the one that was successful. And all of the others were out competed by this life, or maybe it only started once and maybe it only started once in the entire observable universe right here on this one planet in that one puddle or under that beside that one hydrothermal vent, we just don't know. Like if we could find out that spot, then we should erect the finest museum that humanity has ever created. And this is one of the most special places that could exist in the entire observable universe. This was the place where life began that without that spot without that bunch of events happening, then the universe would be devoid of life. Um, and so you should go to that museum and definitely check out the exhibits and definitely, you know, provide a donation and get an annual pass. David Wilson, are there frozen nitrogen asteroids, for example, some that could be directed to Mars to modify the atmosphere. So there are comets, and you know, they're going to have some nitrogen on them, but they're gonna have a lot of other volatile elements are gonna have water mixed with dirt and regolith. And so they would be the ideal things to smash into Mars. But you have the same problem that if you smash a comet into Mars, you're going to make the place remarkably worse, already a bad place, you're gonna make it a lot worse for a long period of time. And then you're gonna have a bunch of gases that are gonna vaporize They're gonna go into the atmosphere. And then the solar wind is going to continue to act on Mars, and eventually over time start to blow those gases away. And, and then you're sort of back to to square one. So the idea that seems the most practical, is that you just block the solar wind if you can somehow put up a sunshade at the Mars Sun L1 Lagrange point, then 
you know, some kind of structure, it doesn't have to be a sun shade, but at least it can block the solar wind, then now the solar wind is no longer uh, tearing away the atmosphere of Mars and the various gases that are escaping Mars, the volcanic gases that are already escaping Mars all the time can actually start to build up in the atmosphere over time. And after a while, those gases build up, the planet warms up, the the ice caps melt and you actually get water on the surface of Mars. So really, it's not about delivering a lot of gases to the surface of Mars. It's about stopping the solar wind from depleting the gases on Mars, giving it a chance to thicken its atmosphere. Did you know you can watch the same video but with no ads and with one bonus question all about how big a moon the Earth can sustain? Now I'll put a link in the show notes and in my comments. So you can go over and watch that right now for free. All right, thanks for watching. Those are all the questions that we had with this episode. Now we record this show live every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world. So uh, if you want to go, we'll have a link to the next episode coming up. So just make sure you click subscribe, notifications bell. I'm sure there's a way to remind you to go and watch the episode when we go live. It's two hours long. It's a lot of fun. All right, I'm going to give you another thing from my shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Brian Body, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, Sean Sargent, James Clark, Bear Lake Roofing, David Matz, Jim Burke, Stephen Fowler Munley, Paul Robach, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Spiderswap.io, David Giltonan, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Abe Kingston, Michael Purcell, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So here's something that's new from the shelf. And so what is this? This is a chunk of the James Webb Space Telescope's sun shield. Uh, and so what it is, is it's a bunch of layers. So you can see we've got the outer kind of gold layer and then it's inside there's a whole bunch more of this sort of reflective material, but also there's like this mesh that fits in between. And so there's ah, 12 layers and then it's built with this little mesh in between that traps the heat and sort of minimizes or slows down how long it's going to take for the heat to make it through all of these different layers to then become a source of infrared for the James Webb Space Telescope. And this was leftover material uh, that was done for the construction and testing. And my co host on astronomy cast Pamela Gay uh, was given a bunch of them and she gave a couple of them to me. So I've got a piece of the James Webb Space Telescope's sunshield behind me. All right, we'll see you next time.